Hi. Um, so I decided tonight, I've been working on this all day today, um, to put together something that will better explain what the rapture means. Um, I know there's some people that, one, they either don't believe in the rapture at all, or they don't understand the actual term of the rapture, or there's non-believers that they've been seeing all these dream videos of the rapture, and, and they don't know exactly what we're talking about so this is kind of just basically um a lot of studying and research that i've put into this and i finally got it all down on paper today and decided to put it on video um i ask that you bear with me uh i get real nervous and sometimes i kind of start choking up and can't get the words out the way i'd like to so um here we go Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. For any of you who have an ear, let him hear. Lord Jesus, my Heavenly Father, I ask that you please guide me and help me put this information out there the best to my capability, Lord. I ask that you speak to whoever needs to hear this, Lord. Open their hearts, open their ears. Let that seed be planted. For those who may not believe at all so that they will go out and search for you lord i ask that this blesses anyone who takes the time to watch it anyone who appreciates it anyone who comes across this bless them give them protection shower them with your grace and your loving kindness lord you are my father my one and only true father lord and i thank you jesus for dying on the cross for me and we're coming back three days later lord i thank you for giving me the opportunity to be able to ask for forgiveness of my sins for being able to re be redeemed lord i ask that you just stay with me during this and help guide me let others have some knowledge and understanding and just receive this with a open, kind, and loving heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so we'll start with um, where, did the word rap where did the term rapture come from? Um, we'll break it down first as far as what the definition of rapture is. Uh, rapture is a joy and delight, the caring of a person the carrying of a person to another place or sphere of existence. In theology, it defines um, it defines it as the meeting Christ in the clouds, uh, midway in the air. Um, the rapture, the term rapture, the word itself, is a state or experience of being carried away. The English word comes from the lap, Latin word repiro which means to seize or snatch in relation to an ecstasy of spirit or an actual removal from one place to another. In other words, it means to be carried away in the spirit or in body. Um, excuse me. The Greek word from this term, rapture is derived, appears in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, and it's translated in English as caught up. Now, the Latin translation of this verse uses the word rapture. Uh, the Greek word is harpazo, harpazo excuse me, sorry, uh, which means to be snatched or taken away. Elsewhere, it is used to describe how the spirit caught up Philip near Gaza and brought him to the Caesarea, uh, Acts chapter 8, 20, uh, 39, sorry. And to describe Paul's experience of being caught up into the third heaven in 2 Corinthians 12 to 14. I'm sorry, 2 to 4. Thus, there can be no doubt that the word is used in 1 Thessalonians 4.17 to indicate that the actual removal of people from earth to heaven. Um, we'll look at more of those examples of foreshadowing of the rapture throughout the Bible um, here momentarily. But... The word rapture, apparently back in 19, or I'm sorry, uh, I say that a lot. 
um, back in 1830, I believe it was, I'm sorry, 1930, 1930s. In the 19th century, uh, John Nelson Darby was the one that got the credit for using that term, state, stating that this is where the actual origins of the uh, rapture is from. Actually, if you go back even further than that, um, you'll see that the early church fathers were teaching the rapture then as well. Um, they are responsible for the origins, not John Darby. Arrhenius, back in uh, 130 to 202 AD, on the subject of the rapture, rapture wrote, Those nations, however, who did not of themselves raise up their eyes unto heaven, nor return thanks to their maker, no wish to behold the light of truth, but who were, like blind mice, concealed in the depths of ignorance, the word justly reckons as waste water from a sink, and as a turning of um, as a turning weight of a balance in fact as nothing and therefore when is the end the church shall be suddenly caught up from this it is said there shall be a great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning neither shall be for this is the last contest of the righteous in which when they overcome, they are crowned with incorruption. And you can find that in the uh, book called Against Heresies. Uh, it'll be chapter 5, verse 29, I'm assuming, or page 29. Um, the word uses this book, the word that's used in this book is actually repturo. Um, you know, you're wondering, I'm sure, well, why am I bringing that up? That's not from the actual Bible, okay? Well, no, but he is teaching what the Bible says, and he was fighting against, he was a martyr, and uh, he was fighting against a lot of the false teachings. There was a lot of heresy going on. Um, that's when the Gnostic teachings were taking place, and that's what he was going against. Why does this guy even really matter? Well, because he studied under Polycarp. And if you know don't know who he is, um, that guy matters a lot. Uh, these teachings that Irenaeus got from Polycarp, Polycarp got from the Apostle John. And Apostle John was the one who actually wrote the book of Revelations. Um, that book, when it was first written, was written in Geek geek sorry greek <laughs> sorry um i'm nervous the greek version of that when they talk about caught up or anything um in relation to being seized whatnot is harpazo which whenever speaking of that in latin when the the book got translated into latin it was termed as repio or uh repturo so that's why that's important. Um, like I was saying, now in the English version, what we read is caught up. It's all the same word. It's just depending on what translation you're going with. Um, it's actually a, a, an event, so to speak. Um, other church, early church fathers that studied under the disciples um, the apostles, 12 disciples, uh, that taught this was uh, Victor, I apologize if I butcher their names, Victorinus and Cyprian. Um, on those guys, you are more than welcome to do your own study and kind <clears> of, <throat> excuse me, um, to see, you know, what it was exactly they taught. But the key one that I really uh, have been fascinated by has been Irenaeus, so that's why I chose to go ahead and, and focus on Irenaeus. Um, so next, <clears throat> now that we know where it's derived from, where we got the word rapture to begin with, um, let's talk about the first statement. I had mentioned earlier that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old uh, Testament revealed. Um, a lot of people state that there was no prior rapture throughout the Bible. Um, so why would we be raptured out of here right before? Well, 
I personally believe we'll be raptured out here pre-trib. Um, so that's what basis I'm going off of at this point. Uh, but what, uh, what I hear is that in the past, you know, God never did that for anybody else. So why would he do it for a pre-trib on us? Um, let's look at some of the examples of Harpazo, Raptura, Rapture, whatever you want to call it, being caught up. That I'll leave that up to you. But we'll see some of the foreshadowing here in the next few things that I talk about. Okay. Now remember, what does the word mean? The translation of the word itself is caught up, caught away, forcibly seized upon, snatched away to take oneself or force of, uh, or forcefully taking someone. Okay. So we've got to keep that in mind when we're reading this because this is how you get to see what for, the foreshadowing is. And when I say foreshadowing, it's the <coughs> foreshadowing is, um, could be a warning or an indication of a future event. So the first example, I'm going to go with Genesis 19, 16. But he, referencing Lot, uh, hesitated. So the man seized his hand, the hand of his wife, and the hands of his two daughters. For the compassion of the Lord was upon him, and they brought him out and put him outside of the city. The scripture not only shows that they were forcibly seized, being raptured, uh, it's a term that we're using here, uh, upon, but if you look at it also, this also goes in play with like the Great Tribulation, they were taken out of God's wrath. He was getting ready to bombard the city and destroy it to nothing, but because of Lot's righteousness and his faith in the Lord, he spared him. He spared him of the wrath, and he raptured him out of that situation, foreshadowing of the rapture out of that situation. So, um, as far as that scripture goes, uh, if that's one scripture ahead where it says, uh, Genesis 19.15, it says, When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your daughters and your two daughters who are here, and you will be, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. So he point blank tells them, look, we got to get you out of here. Um, in fact, they would not be able to actually touch the city whatsoever until Lot was out. That was God's command. They couldn't do anything until Lot got out of the city. Um, why Lot was really chosen, you know, like I said, he was righteous. He was a righteous man. Uh, saving Lot from the wrath of God, he saw that Lot had not succumbed to the lustful, um, degenerate, rampant that was going on in the city. And so God kept him safe. He didn't fall for all the muck that was going on around them. Um, to go a little dip, bit deeper with it, there are three key points to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. One, in Jude 1, and this is this goes along with revelations as far as the rapture and stuff. And this is some of the signs, too, that we see that we need to be aware of. Um, in Jude 1, it says, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as these, indulged in gross immortality and after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. That is referencing into uh, the judgment day. The, that is the judgment day when it comes down to it. And it says that um, during the tribulation, when that time comes, the end of times, that the days are going to be like it was back in Sodom and Gomorrah. And we we are here. I mean, there is no denying that. Yeah, everywhere you look, everything is so corrupt and twisted. And it's wicked. Um, so second <clears throat> Peter chapter two, six, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to ex extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. That is what's going to happen to us. Fire, brimstone, all that stuff. That is what's going to happen to those who are not saved, that are not 
um, that are non-believers. And I personally don't want that. I want to try to take as many with me, you know, when it's time to go. I, I want to be able to say, hey, George, down the street or, you know, uh, Lisa down the road or whatnot. I, you know, I want to see them up there with me. Um, I don't want to lose anybody, period. I don't care if they're a stranger to me, you know. I live here in Austin, and every day I drive by this one area that there's just homeless camps. I don't know what they're going through, but I pray every morning over them. Because even those people, I don't know if they believe, you know, I don't know what their situation is. But I pray for each one of them that they're at least talking to God and trying to get, you know, some kind of spiritual connection with them if they don't have that. Um, I want to see them with me up there. Um, and we're supposed to be doing that. And, you know, right now we're living in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, it is all around us. Uh, we need to be on our knees repenting, um, praying, praying for our loved ones especially, praying for other people, um, praying for their protection, that no one can catch them with their guard let down and, and pull them aside and start whispering, you know, this and that, setting up stumbling blocks so they'll fail. Um, and we really need to pray over our kids. I mean, all of them, because right now they are the most susceptible to being sucked away from the Word of God. I, they've got so much that's being shoved in their face, you name it. It doesn't take but a second for them to be lost. So with that, we, we need to remember that um, with Sodom and Gomorrah, that's the kind of days that we're living in now. And we need to do whatever we can to get people saved and, and help them as much as we can to follow God's word so that they can be raptured out of here. Um, second key point, Lot and his family were uh, spared by being seized and removed from the situation god's wrath this is what it will be like for us and our rapture we're going to be seized and pulled straight out of here you know um, as long as we have accepted our lord and savior jesus christ we are going to be taken out of here um the rapture is imminent uh, meaning, you know, and, and that's the way it was with Lot. Even Lot, he wasn't, you know, made aware of the time or hour or anything like that. He didn't even know it was going to go down until the angels came to, to him and said, Hey, it's time to get out of here. You know, it's about to get real. And so he, he was raptured out of that situation. The third key point is for Christians and believers. Um, true believers. There is a difference between someone that just believes and then... People that truly believe and have surrendered. Yeah, you can believe, yeah, there's Jesus, you know, but not accepting him, not putting all your faith in him, not surrendering to him. That's that's where you got to uh, draw the line there. You got to figure that out and sort that out for yourself. Do you really truly believe in him or do you just believe in the notion of him? That, yeah, he was a man that walked the face of the earth. I mean, there's there is a dramatic difference. <coughs> for those that do believe in him, God's going to keep us from that wrath. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> so basically, when you combine all that together, we live in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. And just like Lot, we will also be seized up from the wrath um, that God pours out on earth. Okay. So now I'm going to look at some more um, examples of the rapture uh, foreshadowing. Okay. Second Kings 2.11. As they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot, a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which appeared, I'm sorry, excuse me, which appeared the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Genesis 5, 24, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. In Hebrews 11, 5, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death and he was not found because God took him took him up for he obtained the witness that before his being taken up he was pleasing to God okay so God not only with Enoch God not only uh, raptured him out 
but he also once again saved him from the wrath that was about to pour out on the earth, um, which was the, the great flood. Um, now, people are, may ask, okay, well, what about Noah? Well, Noah couldn't be raptured out. Noah established a new covenant with God, um, which was a pretty big job. Him and his family were responsible for repopulating. Um, he was the new rightful heir to everything. And basically, look at Noah as the representation of Israel. He was pretty much the new Israel. He was to restart everything for us. Um, that's the reason why God saved him from the flood by protecting him in the ark. Um, so back to the rapture foreshadowing. 2 Corinthians 12, 2. I know a man in Christ who, was four, who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I do not know. God knows such a man was caught up to the third heaven. This was Paul. And I don't, oh yeah, one of the biggest ones, sorry. <laughs> kind of reading my notes, my glasses, the glare and everything starting to mess with me a little bit. But um, one of the biggest ones that I didn't even realize was there until I read it. And then I realized, oh my gosh, okay, this is kind of exciting. Um, but Revelations 12, 5. <coughs> <clears throat> and she gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule all the nations with the God, or I'm sorry, with the rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. We all know who that is. And I get goosebumps just talking about that. That's exciting. That's my bridegroom. He's right there. That tells you he was even taken up. Um, so now that we have established Harpazo, Raptura, Rapture, foreshadowing, let's take a look at God keeping us from his wrath because that's another issue. Like people, um, I've heard things like, well, God doesn't uh, keep us from his wrath. Look what happened here. Look what happened there. The righteous ones he does. And we're nearing to the end of this, I think. Um, so be patient and, and let me share this portion with you if you don't mind. Um, we'll go back to 2 Peter uh, 2, 4. <coughs> on, sorry. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, two, four. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he, br when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. And if you rescued righteous lot, lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the righteousness under, under unrighteousness under punishment for the day of judgment. This entire passage here gives examples of where he's pulled them from the wrath, from punishment, and from destruction. You've got uh, Noah, and you've got, um, sorry, uh, I just went blank a lot um, in there, and it tells you exactly what happens to all that are wicked. <clears throat> One of the most convincing pieces of evidence that I found in the Bible, um, is one of my favorite verses. Um, I feel, when I read it, every time I read it, I feel this power behind the words. I It just 
it speaks to me dramatically. Um, and it also shows that turning point too. When Jesus came and died for us, his resurrection, all that taking place, it changed everything for everyone. Everyone. So, <clears throat> Romans chapter 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. I want to read that one more time. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if, for, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to, God's, to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now reconciled the reconciliation. That scripture alone from Romans 5, 8, all the way down, speaks volumes. It, I, I, I don't know what could possibly tell you any different when it says right there plain as day that we will not be subject to God's wrath when he pours it out on this earth um, when I read that I broke into tears I felt the Holy Spirit moving and I mean it has stuck with me for the last three weeks since I found this scripture and I have absolutely fallen in love with that scripture and I hold on to that promise I mean, that's, that's God telling us right there. We're not going to have to worry. You know, we need, that is, we don't have to worry as long as we've accepted Jesus and we've redeemed ourselves, asked for his forgiveness. We're saved. We are the bride. So we must be ready. It's simple to be saved. You only have to believe in our Heavenly Father and profess that the Lord Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again three days later, putting true belief and faith in him. That moment you will begin a new life in which you will turn away from sin and walk in the Lord's path. He loves you. He, he loves every single one of us. He loves the sinners. And we, as humans, we sit there and we tend to Constantly look at them and fault them and fault them and, and, and instead of praying for them like we're supposed to be doing, like Jesus was doing, we turn the other cheek from them. You don't have to sit there and, and be best buddies with them and, you know, move in with them. But you do need to be praying for them. You know, if, if my family gave up on me, I was an alcoholic. I was... Oh God, I, I literally had to do a, an evaluation of what sins did I, I commit. And I pretty much broke every commandment, every law, almost all of them, um, in the Bible. Once I finally gave up trying to live the world for myself and I gave up everything and surrendered it over to Lord, I'm different a hundred percent different i stay in prayer all day long i sit there anything that happens anything that happens whether it's good or bad i'm in prayer either thanking them or asking them to guide me i you know ask to be filled with the holy spirit to help give me understanding of things i pray for revelation on different aspects of my life or when something happens it, it's a night and day difference from the person that I was to the person I am now. Um, and I'm thankful. I'm thankful that he loved me that much to give me that opportunity. 
I was just too blind, like the blind mice, to see what I had all along. And I kept rejecting it and rejecting it. He never rejected me. I rejected him. So now, I'm, I'm doing this. This is all I do now is study the word. And I try to teach it to my kids. I try to, you know, encourage my husband to get as involved as I am with it. And try to get it, as much of revelation and understanding and, and knowledge as I possibly can on this. Granted, you know, with his guidance. It's not that hard to change your life. All I had to do was just put the bottle down and get on my knees and pray. Save me. Help me. I don't know what to do. I can't do this my way anymore because it's not working. And I'd probably be dead right now if I hadn't stopped. I have gained so much more since I have gotten my life on right, the right track. My kids talk to me. My family talks to me. I used to not have that. I feel peace in my soul. I used to not have that. I was fighting demons all the time, but now I don't fight any battles. Sorry. I just wish that more people were experiencing this and, and that's the reason why I think I think that's the reason why I am trying to get this out there so they understand how beautiful it is and, and that he's going to be here any minute any minute we don't know when but he's going to be here any minute he is at the threshold and I don't want anybody left behind I don't want them to go through hell and it's going to be hell. You're going to be scrambling to find food. You're going to be scrambling to... Fighting for your lives. I mean... It, there's not going to be any law. At all. I totally went way off of my notes here. I guess that's good. More genuine, right? But... It's important. It is important to get right and, and to do what you need to do to get close to him. Because he's your only way out of here. He is your only way out of here. And the love he has for us, there's nothing, nothing on this earth that could love you as much as he loves you. Nothing, not no human, not anything, your animals. I mean, there is nothing, you'll never experience that kind of loving kindness, that kind of compassion and mercy and grace like you do with him. And I'm, I'm so grateful and thankful that he saved me when he did. And that 